listening to the multiple award losing Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. You have my pity. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. Don't let them have your magnificent man sack. And Big Anklevich. You Come have on. animal sex on the brain. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. My name is Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And we are back. The man behind the mask? <laughs> I swear, you're the only person that remembers that song. <laughs> Anywhere. Okay. Alice Cooper is just like, I never recorded this song. <laughs> we'll see uh, in the comments. If you remember that song, say so. All right. Thanks, everybody. And wait. Oh, we have a show to do. We're back with another one of our fabulous triple word score stories. Uh, you want to rephrase? Just say it again without the fabulous. All right. <laughs> We're back with another one of our triple word score stories. Oh, rephrase. Say, say it again, but without stories. Oh, still. yeah. We're back with another one of our triple word scores. All right, I guess that's technically correct. <laughs> Tell the folks real quick, in the abbreviated lawyer speak at the end of the commercial version, the, the quick rules of the triple word score thing. I can't do that. To you can't do the lawyer speak? piece of crap. Legalese at the end. of <laughs> May cause birth defects in monkeys. <laughs> Basically, the rules for the uh, triple word score story were you had to write a short story. 2,000 words or smaller, I believe, mm -hmm. featuring three words that we drew at random from, from a, a hat. hat. Yes. Still and have the picture of it somewhere. <laughs> don't go looking for it. I think that, that that's about it. It, it uh, Apparently, we weren't specific enough with the rules, uh, hence uh, what you're about to hear. That's right, yeah. Today's offering is uh, from... Someone you've heard the name of several times before. He's produced dozens, probably, of, of episodes for our show. He's narrated episodes for our show. He's been a voice actor on episodes for our show. I think that this is the first time we've ever done something that he's written, though. Is that true? Does that sound correct to you? As far as I know, yeah. So He's also a doctor. A doctor and a lawyer. And an Indian chief, I believe, as well. They all walk into a bar and the bar... <laughs> is, is he all those things? I didn't know. I think oh, he's a professor amazing. and a doctor and a lawyer and an Indian chief. Okay. And many, many children would call him father if they knew who he was. <laughs> he's also one handsome man. Yes, he is, as your wife can attest uh, in the midst of your lovemaking. <laughs> and his name is? His name is... Algar Van Kluth. Algar Van Kluth. That's not a real name. <laughs> no. Okay. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> Algar Van Kluth hasn't merited an appearance on the show, darn it. But he will. I will take Brian Lincoln for 400, Alex. No, you're supposed to uh, say your answer in the form of a question, actually. Oh, uh, There's a reason why you didn't make the show. <laughs> And it's not just because you thought devolution was what inspired the name of the band Devo. Who is Brian Lincoln, Alex? Very good. Very good, sir. Brian Lincoln. Yes, you're right. Brian my Lincoln. My wager was one dollar. <laughs> Don't you hate the people that do that? For Final Jeopardy. That's that's the guy that always wins, though, because he's so far, he's ahead, so far ahead that he yeah. knows that he'll win. But so he, he doesn't need to wager. I know, but I hate that. It's like, come on. <laughs> At least put some kind of risk into it. You're going to win no matter what, but don't. So anyways, yeah, Brian Lincoln is here with us. Oh, you know what we could do? Kill him. We could have, <laughs> we could have announcer man say his name because announcer man has said his name for us. Oh, hell no, Big Anklevich. So yeah, Brian Lincoln is here with his first appearance as an author on our show. An author. And his offering is called... <laughs> The Short Life and Slow Death of Timmy Van Lowe. So uh, here comes the story then. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, the offering uh, from Brian Lincoln. The Short Life and Slow Death of Timmy Van Lowe. It was produced by Sunny C. 
And he's also the man who made the awesome art that comes along with this story, which I just absolutely loved. And he's also the guy who narrates this story. And he's the guy that did the tap dance sequence in the middle. And he's also the guy that ran the craft service table during the production as well. So really, he did a lot of things for today's show. I think I got them all. Is is there anything I missed? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I was miles away. Just imagining Brian Lincoln on a beach somewhere. Oh. All oiled up. <laughs> okay. I wonder if that makes Brian Lincoln feel uncomfortable or... Where's that set of earplugs I brought? Yeah. We... All right. So uh, there you go. Uh, story's starting now. We're just going to move on. <laughs> See you later, folks, on the other side. The Short Life and Slow Death of Timmy Van Lo. I was pulled from my dream with familiar distaste to the feeling my head had been stretched and displaced towards some unknown location of sadness and waste to do my sworn duty with professional haste. I woke to discover a too common plight, a hurt frightened child alone in the night, screaming for mother and father and sight. Between cries of pain, this time just to my right. It took me a moment to objectively tell that the cause of my visit was where the boy fell. By a squint of my eye and a wet, musty smell, I discovered our place, an old water well. The depths of that hole, less water than rock, had caused a sudden blunt trauma, disfigurement, shock, and his tibia thrust through a hole in his sock. I pulled out my scrapbook with pencil and chalk. I drew the poor boy with bold strokes and sly scratches, capturing pain on his face, blood seeping in patches. Then while centered on how his loose shoulder attaches, missed him acquiring a bundle of matches. For I'd failed to spy his gradual calm, while with a tiny veteran soldier's aplomb, he unscrewed the hilt of his knife with one palm, till the matches flew free alongside fish hooks and balm. He shouted, Who is it? Is someone around? And I knew in a blink he could hear the weak sound of my drawing the scene where he would never be found. And I shuddered, I muttered, and most certainly frowned. Do not light that match. You won't like what you see. I said to the boy in a helpless, soft plea. He did not obey, and he set that light free and was no longer lonely. For now, he had me. Who and what are you? He asked through his hurt. You look like an ape in a colonist shirt. I said, I'm an artist, you impotent squirt. My temper quite hot and my mind on alert. Don't mind how I look. It doesn't matter at all. Soon you will die from your unfortunate fall. Now let me record you with token and scrawl before another dead child is all I recall. I don't want to die, the boy said with a whine. It hurts me much less now. I think I'll be fine. Still annoyed he could see me. A curious sign, I said, What, you're a doctor? You're probably nine. I'm ten, he shouted with rage in his eyes. My dad got me this, just look at the size. As he held up the knife, his new birthday prize, I backed to the wall, lest my chest he in size. For the light had gone out, he was once again blind, as he swung the blade sideways in front and behind. Can I hold it? I asked, but he quickly declined as he found a new match with keen presence of mind. I said, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to collect. This is my job, to record, not correct. 
Here, here's my scrapbook. I'll let you inspect. As long as in trade I get the knife you protect. He did not relent, so brave for his age. So to show my goodwill I turn back just one page to a sketch of a girl in a rusted old cage. I hoped it would calm him his anger assuage. Who is she? he wondered, bringing light forward slow. I inched the book closer, its pages aglow. This one was dead, for I learned I don't know. To which the boy blurted, I'm Timmy Van Lowe. I turned to another, the back seat of a car. The windows rolled up, babe too heated by far. The boy jabbed a finger. A monster you are! If you were there drawing, not helping Tovar. Little Tim was a bright one, saw I'd written a name on the arm of the car seat right down by the frame. Sorry, Tim, I said, but I'm not to blame. I've tried to save many. They all in the same. Then what good are you and why are you here? Timmy then asked with a petulant sneer. I said, I'm not good nor evil. I hope that is clear. Now hand me the knife so I can draw without fear. And handed he did, offered hollow hilt first, a responsible gesture, as if often rehearsed. Your father, he taught you to share it reversed? A regrettable question, his bravery burst. I want my daddy, he cried as if for, his pain rushing back, his arms pounding the floor. I said, sorry, I'm sorry, I won't mention him more. But the calmness was ruptured along with any rapport. Till his energy faded, and his poor hands they bled, and Timmy looked up and with raw eyes in his head, I hate you, Dad, that was the last thing I said. I cannot unsay it, for soon I'll be dead. Why would you say such a terrible thought? I asked the poor child, all frail and fraught. Cause I was mad at my sister for the blanket she got when it was my birthday and hers it was not. You see, my sister is dying, her heart is not good. My parents, they love her more than anyone should. I asked, you were jealous? But I understood that while I knew such time precious, no child would. So you ran from your party, new knife by your side. To which he said boldly, My knife was my guide. And he gave me the compass, almost bursting with pride. The handle says Eastman, so it is East that I tried. I gave it inspection, a twist and a tilt, and so it did say on the shiny new hilt, The knife from a father who'll be riddled with guilt, for ignoring one child to give another a quilt. As I wrote the word Eastman on my penciled depiction, I fought an old urge to fight interdiction and try to prevent such a fatal prediction, not of the son's but the father's affliction. But I watched the boy weaken, become resigned to his fate, and look up to me asking, does a heaven await? To which I admit I did hesitate. But then I said, no, there's no pearly gate. I'm sorry to say you are dead when you die. When consciousness leaves, it'll fade and not fly. Timmy Van Low, he did nothing but sigh, and look up the tall well toward the clouds in the sky. Then down his small face, a distressing tear, faintly dripped to the floor, a light tink in my ear. The boy settled down, the cold ground his new beer. You shan't be forgotten, Tim, that's why I'm here. And once he'd breathed his last breath and left me alone, I scraped off a piece of his shattered leg bone and glued it in place beside a slightly wet stone to finish the page that was all the boy's own. But despite that last moment, I wasn't quite done. I thought of the father, and made a quick run, 
to carve with a knife for a certain someone the words, Dad, I love you, Timmy, your son. Then I took up the compass, last but not least, and rose from the blank, doomed, decrepit, deceased, to the rim of the well, where from my hand it released, sitting needle-point north, so that inward was east. I watched, and I waited. I paced to and fro, till the father came round, deliberate, slow, and he spotted the compass, peered far, far below, though what happened next I'm afraid I can't know. For my clock had run out, my waking time passed, and sleep came to take me back home, oh so fast, to that quiet, empty place, purgatorial, vast, to dream once again that a dead child was my last. Alright everybody, welcome back. They're gone, they're long gone. <laughs> what the crap? Yes, uh, that was not perhaps what you might have expected from our show. Although, when it comes down to it, it's not the first poem that we've run on the show. Uh, I guarantee you, it will be the last poem. <laughs> just Yeah, sometimes we need to just, I think, use our power as editors... When it comes to these contests and just veto and just say, I'm sorry, Brian Lincoln knows damn well that he shouldn't be sending us a poem. And yeah, he might have uh, counted on the judges being amused that he did a poem and and it it got through despite the one and negative one that you and I (laughs) gave it respectively. But yeah, I mean, Brian came in here and ran amok leaving me to wonder, what the f***? (laughs) That's right. So the cast list, as we said before the story started, Sonny... You almost said it. (laughs) You are almost struck dead. (laughs) Sonny C was our narrator, producer, and everything else. So maybe I guess that makes him also a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief as well, right? None of those things. Oh, he doesn't even have a last name. <laughs> but he did produce long, long, long ago when we still did Dune Steve episodes. And so thank you, Sonny, for that. And he did the episode art for this weekend last week. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> last yeah. month. Or yeah, I was going to say you might want to. Last wanna, quarter, whenever that was. <laughs> you might want to modify that phrase in the form of a question, please. Uh, every time we do one of these stories an angel gets its wings yes no i think a demon gets its wings actually (laughs) good job azazel that's right good job (laughs) he just says actually every time we do one of these we have three questions three multiple part questions for the authors to answer People are so sick of these darn questions aren't they probably i was sick of them after the very first time so I don't know how far. We've probably done at least four of these by now, right? Four T. <laughs> I will be playing the part of the questioner. And I will be playing the part of the human. It was the part I was born to play, baby. And I will put on my Brian Lincoln hat. Imagine I were a thousand times better looking. There you go. Question number one. Was this a fun contest for you? Is writing generally fun to do anyway? How did the rules of this contest make it more or less enjoyable for you? I had a lot of fun writing this. The words and the length limit really helped to decide on the specific details of the story before the first word was put down. It was written in almost a single sitting, with a few edit passes later on. I've never written a poem before, but it was a lot of fun. The trick was not to force the rhymes, while still being very strict with them. That's interesting. Thank you, Mr. Lincoln. Question number two. You were given three words at random. How much impact did the three words have on the finished product? How did you decide in what way to use the words? My words were knife, east, and scrapbook. 
So obviously I had to write about a boy falling down a well to his death. Seriously, the scrapbook was the key. Once I decided on a dark poem, uh, I liked the idea of a scrapbook recording the deaths of people who died alone. Limiting it to children just made it darker. When I was a kid, I once got a knife as a gift. It had a compass on the hilt that you could twist off to get to an internal compartment. I took that idea and my other word, east, to have the knife gift lead the boy to the well and his ultimate death. Thank you very much, Mr. Lincoln. And finally, who? Do you hear laughter? Who is your favorite doctor? Technically, I'm a doctor, and I'm quite fond of myself. But if you are referring to the best Doctor Who actor, I'd have to go with David Tennant. David Tennant is my daughter's favorite doctor as well. And mine as well. She was very upset when they switched from him to the next one. She did not like that Max Smith... Is it Max Smith? Matt Smith, yeah. Matt Smith. Okay, good thing that I asked because I said Max. (laughs) Oh, I thought this was just an aside to me. No, what are you going on? She did not like that Matt Smith was fond of fezes. No, I'm not either. Holy cow, (laughs) every time I go to conventions and I see... These imbeciles wearing these, ironically, imbecilic hats. I always think, oh, shoot, you know. He's fond of bow ties as well, but not nearly as many wear the bow ties. Shame. Yeah, the fez is more characteristic, more iconic, you know what I'm saying? It's not, though. Lots and lots of people wear bow ties. Perry the platypus wore a fez once, though. Mm. But that was just because they thought they were in Egypt, and so they needed to wear fezes to to fit in. Hey, you're not wearing your fez. Better go to the fez dispenser. So, first things first. uh, Well, first things first. uh, Poem. Uh. But second things first. (laughs) While you were listening to the production. Yeah? Did you hear, like, this creepy whispering voice? Like, not throughout the whole thing, but every once in a while there would be this voice, like, suggesting that you do things and... Just like, kind of like a kind, a kind of whispery voice, just like when the narrator would pause. Right, exactly. Yeah, all the, all the time you would hear this voice, just just so quiet. You couldn't make out what it was saying, really. Just a word here and there. No, I didn't hear that at all. That you thought that was part of the story because I didn't. Well, no, I'm I'm sure that it was part of the whatever music Sonny chose to to put underneath that creepy, ominous, like ooh, that the music was just. It was disturbing. It was more disturbing, I think, than the text of the story. I, I don't think there was music in this story, actually. I don't, I don't know what you're talking It was just a straight read. Oh. Never mind. But I did like the way he did the uh, production of the story. It was really well done. Don't you think? Uh, yeah, I think so. Now, I, I might have to listen to it again. No. I might have had a bad speaker. Yeah. Uh, No, I think he did a fine job, and, you know, he, once again, did it long, long ago, back when we were doing the Dune (laughs) Stephen. Probably wondered if it would ever hit the air. And really, you know, we could probably have had him do three or four episodes since then, but we didn't. (laughs) But hopefully he will come back and do that again. Yeah, Sonny is the one, I mean, of all the people, Sonny is the one who's never content with doing things just the way that a, a normal person would do it. Now, that sounds like an insult. But it's just, there's a, a, a way that you would expect things to be done. And Sonny always throws that out. And he's like, no, 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 no. We're going to enter through the wall instead of the door. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that that's really unique to him. So everything that he produces, always, yeah, it's always surprising. It's always like, okay, what did he do on this one? Yeah, I think that they usually turn out really well, too. There's been lots of times, like, for example, I remember Sonny was the producer for... Beachcomber or Beachcombing? Beachcomber, Beachcomber, Little Beachcomber, Bo Beachcomber, Little Bo Peep. Okay, now we're getting confused here. But uh, anyways, yeah, and he was he was the one who came up with the idea to... He gave us characters. Yeah. And then had us do monologues for each one of these characters, right? Yeah, characters that the child like heard in his head when he touched the item that made them... Uh, you know, because that was what he had. Somebody said the name for this power that this kid had, like telekinographica mm-hmm. or something. I can't remember what the word was because it's been like three years since we ran that story. But Or done in Doonstief. <laughs> yeah, there you go. 
but he would touch the thing and it would give him a powerful memory or something from the person that last touched this thing. And yeah, we'd get the memory of the guy proposing to his wife there on the beach. And one of us got to play the part of the guy. And I don't know, it, it worked out really well. They were just kind of there in the background. You sort of heard them, but didn't really kind of a thing. I want to say the other one that Sonny produced was the... That's a cat outside, isn't it? That weird noise. You see, this time it's me that doesn't hear a weird noise. <laughs> okay. The, the he, other yeah. one that he produced was his the Lady Sword Master or whatever that story Lady was. Lady Smith Mombazo, yeah. <laughs> that was the one where the guy oh, I, has I, lost I, all his clothes and so he has to put on somebody's dress when the city is being captured. Yeah, and I then was there's like me the and Smithers. you. And you were the king, right? And I said "sir" instead of "sire," and that's bothered me ever since. It's like there's not like a week that goes by that I don't go, "Why didn't I say sire or your grace? Why did I say sir? Oh, I sound so American." And we're through. I'm the old king, so I can't see. And you're like, "Oh, and the dress clings to her. Oh, because her bosoms. Oh, my well, well, sorry, no bosoms at all. Oh, that's a shame. I love the large bosoms." All right, so what did you think of this offering that we cannot call a story, but it is a dark poem? It is dark. Especially with that weird whispering thing, Ryan. Well, did you hear that? What? Uh, it, it, <laughs> it reminded me of Poe, and I don't know if it's just because it was, you know, a morbid subject matter and it happened to rhyme, but I gotta admit, I don't really know... You know what it all meant? Uh-huh. Um, but in fact, let me turn the tables and her- quickly cover myself and say, what, what did you think, Big? Uh, it was, I thought, really well done, for one. I don't know that I could put together a good, passable poem. Uh, I'm not really a fan of poetry, uh, and that might be part of the reason why. I don't spend time reading it. When I hear a poem like this, it doesn't remind me of Poe. It reminds me of the one poet that I'm really familiar with, which is Dr. Seuss. Oh, okay. (laughs) And I kept thinking of, you know, he would say something and there'd be a couple of rhymes and then I'd want to say, said the cat. I think there was an absence of bullshit words, though, in this, so it could not have been Dr. Seuss. I suppose that's true. (laughs) Anyway, but (laughs) But, what, 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 any idea what it meant what it me- i don't know what it could have meant i mean obviously we got the story that there was a a boy who was upset at his dad and he ran off and he was using his little compass that came in his knife by the way you had at least knew somebody that had one of these knives when you were younger right sure i never got one myself because i didn't ever get anything myself because when i was younger i was children, yeah. i was too poor but because your parents had too many yes children. yes Everybody I knew had one of those knives, though. It was basically it was the Rambo knife. I know that Rambo had one in one of the movies. He actually pulls out the freaking compass and uses it. And I remember seeing that at one point going, what the hell? Rambo really is trying to use that? Co- There's no way that compass works. That knife was a freaking toy. But maybe that's not the case. Maybe it was a real knife. Anyways, this kid had that knife and he's following it. He fell down the well. And then there's some being whose job seems to be when a child is dying alone to go and sketch it. Um, and it's said in there that normally, you know, the child that dies doesn't know that he's there doing this, making a drawing of him in the scrapbook. One time, I guess he says that the child was already dead. Another time, uh, somehow he got the name of the child enough to write it on the side of the car seat of the child that was left in the car to die. <sighs> this is really depressing. Are you sure you didn't write it? It's a really... De- <laughs> this is more depressing than stories that I write, I think. Because your subject du jour is dead children. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, what I was 
hoping is that you would say, I don't know what it means. Let's ask Sonny. But but I don't know what it means. I'm just kind of going over, okay, this is what happened. But what is this creature that comes and writes in a scrapbook? You would think maybe it's a supernatural creature, but it tells the, the child that there is no life after death. So I don't know if that means, okay, there's no supernaturalism or whatever the word might be for that, to make that into an, a, a noun. Does that preclude supernaturalism if there is no life? Out? It's not a ghost, right? Would it lie to the child purposefully to make it hurt worse? Well, maybe it, is it an evil feeds creature? on despair. Right. And if you tell a child, oh, you're going to die, and that's it, and there's nothing, the child is going to become more fearful and more... I mean, it, it, but I didn't At get the it, feeling that it was that kind of a creature. It seemed no, like it, a benevolent. It seemed like it was pitying the right. boy. It was like, um, and it even went and scratched a I love you dad or whatever and made it so that the dad could even find his body instead of him always being lost forever. Right, but I got the impression that this was a unique case, that it didn't usually do stuff like that. That it maybe, maybe it wasn't allowed hmm. to do stuff like that and it was bending the rules in this case because it was Timmy going had... to get a spanking when it got back for doing such things. See, now who's thinking of Brian Lincoln? <laughs> what do you think? We've been working on our spit takes all morning. Oh. Yeah, see, at first I thought it was just a dude. A creepy old dude who had, and he might not even be old, but who had set this trap and it had caught yet another kid and it's like ooh fun or maybe there are several traps like this and it goes from trap to trap just hoping that there's a kid in each one but then yeah it knew things or it 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 hinted toward not just being a just a guy as but being something else an other and so then i thought well okay it's like the angel of death or an angel of death a a grim reaper kind of thing but i don't know we should ask Sonny. Do you think Sonny knows? Uh, is it possible to ask him? Well, hold on. Let me just send a quick text to him. Look, we don't even know if he's awake. I mean, it, it, we don't have time to just sit here and... Uh... Ew, seriously? So gross. Oh, what the hell was that? Oh, that was my... Sorry, that's my text uh, sound. It just makes that sound when I get a text in return. So Okay, as I was saying... He's already like answered. It. Sonny? Yeah, yeah, I just got a, a text back from him. Um, let me read what he says. When I was in high school, I recall my English teacher giving us the assignment to explain what the author had in mind, or what a particular story means. There was much debate over such things, and the instructor made the point that as long as the reader could make a good case for what he thought the author meant, then he would get a passing grade. One wise guy said, what if I think the author was just hungry for peanut butter, and that's what the story is about? The teacher said that as long as the reader could point to things in the story that supported what he thought, then that was acceptable. Wait, Sonny typed all this stuff? And oh, just hold on, I'm not done. There's more. The story took me a while to come up with a plausible scenario for what is really going on, and since you guys asked me, I will now tell you one possible explanation for what is happening in this story, or at least my take on it. At first read, it might seem that the narrator has some supernatural abilities, or is himself a supernatural creature. Mm. I don't think that is the case. I think that the narrator is either an alien or from the future. I can't help but think of the movie 12 Monkeys, where Bruce Willis's character kept going back to the past, not to try and change things there, but to get information to help fix problems in the future. Perhaps the narrator is forced to go back and he can only be there for short periods of time, hence his clock running out. He is perhaps sent back to record traumatic events either for historical records or to help those in the future. Maybe all of humanity has lost fellow feeling and he is hoping to stir empathy in them, as in the Star Trek TOS episode the empath or perhaps he is an alien that is sent to find out all the weaknesses of the human race who knows only brian lincoln i suppose either way what a creepy eerie story so that's uh that was sonny's response to our text 
dude, that boggles my mind. How did he prepare all of that stuff just while we were... Re- why don't we have the producers do that every single week? Magically... That like, gives us a whole episode without us having to do I know, any work. I, 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 he thought about this in the 15 seconds after receiving the email before sending it back to us. He gave this way more thought. And now uh, it's something that you say all the time, which you stole from me, is that the person that does the audiobook adaptation knows the story better than anybody save the author himself. Because you listen to it over and over and over and over again, yeah. pass after pass. So yes, he's more familiar with Brian's poem than anybody, maybe even than Brian. But I, I appreciate that he gave so much thought to it. I, I, I well, I appreciate it. We would be the show, the episode would be done by now if uh, Sonny hadn't contributed those way more than two cents. Yeah, that was at least ten cents. Yeah, that's really interesting stuff. Um, I'm curious, you who know every single episode ever of all the Star Treks, you've seen this Empath episode of TOS, which stands for the original series, right? It does. I don't know. I, I, what? I don't remember. I, it might be the one with Diana Muldar. She was in two episodes of the original series. But I that doesn't sound familiar to you then the one it, where an empath tries there was to an episode called the empath but I, I, I you don't can't remember it. it oh my gosh I cannot believe someone finally stumped you well no I, we mentioned de-evolution already so. <laughs> uh, okay so I guess we won't talk about that then no in fact let's cut out everything save what Sonny had to say <laughs> Twelve Monkeys you are familiar with, though, right? I love Twelve Monkeys. And, yeah, I would posit that it's the best Terry Gilliam film of all, including the Monty Python-related stuff. There's just something so fatalistic about it. The, The idea that, like, all of the people that they encounter in the past are already dead. There's nothing we can do for them. That is such a unique point of view, and and... Oh, it's so good. Now, there's something else going on with 12 Monkeys, and I don't know if it's one of those things where they they had a script that was really straightforward, and then they said, well, let's add, like, a lot of esoterica to it, stuff that people are going to be like, whoa, what does this mean? And throwing a bunch of WTF-ery and all that stuff. (laughs) Or if... That's just what Terry Gilliam does in all of his films. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I think it's something that he really enjoys. It's kind of like David Lynch, too. You know, It's like David Lynch could take a normal three-act script and turn it into a David Lynch film where you're just like, holy crap, what did, where did that came out of nowhere? What does this mean? And stuff like that. And it was one of those movies where you know I, my friends and I would talk about it and what does the ending mean? And, and uh, recently, the Sci-Fi Channel, which... Uh, is S Y F Y now, um, so I can't watch it. The Sufi channel, the, that that one, the Sufi channel, it has decided to do a series based on Twelve Monkeys. Oh yeah, and it starts, I believe, in January of 2015. Which, by the time this episode airs, is ancient history. Yeah, it's just taking the exact same premise of a future society that that has been completely wiped out, and people have had to go underground to survive, to not die from whatever pathogen is in the air, and. They have the ability to send somebody back in time, not to prevent the disaster, but to find a way to fix it for them. And, uh, you know, he he goes back to our present, which is the past to him. And he ends up, you know, falling in love and and uh, not wanting to go back. I don't know. I just there are moments in 12 Monkeys that resonate with me all. The, I think about him all the time. And, uh, you know, he's institutionalized because they assume that he's crazy because of the things that he says and all that stuff. And and then when they they bring him back, they're just furious that, you know, he was that he, they said, did you waste your opportunity by, you know, having sex and taking drugs? And he's like, they made me take drugs. He's like, who would make you take drugs? <laughs> I don't I just that for some reason, I always think of that. Who would make you? Oh, I love 12 Monkeys. I, it's just so good. I wish we were watching that instead of the doing the dudes. <laughs> Did you think Madeline Stowe was hot? Yeah. I really liked Madeline Stowe in this movie called Revenge with uh, Kevin Costner. I think it was like 1989 kind of thing. And I thought she was really hot then. Yeah, see, uh, I... The thing with Madeline Stowe in 12 Monkeys is that like they beat the crap out of her. And so she's got like a nosebleed and a uh, 
black eye and stuff through half the movie. <laughs> See, I fell in love with Madeline Stowe from the uh, Last of the Mohicans film. And uh, seeing her again in 12 Monkeys made me happy. I haven't seen 12 Monkeys since those days, though, so I don't remember it as well as you. As a matter of fact, I barely remember it all. I do know that Brad Pitt was in it, Madeline Stowe was in it, Bruce Willis was in it. Yeah, and I wrote a script for a Christmas movie not too long after 12 Monkeys came out. I think it was probably like 97 or it may have actually been 1996 when I wrote it. And I was shopping it around film school, trying to get other film students interested in doing it. And all I would, the, story, the, the script was called 12 Days. And I never showed it to anyone without getting some kind of 12 Monkeys comment <laughs> with that story. So that's what I remember most about 12 Monkeys, sadly, which is not a lot. I know this has nothing to do with Brian's poem, but there's this part where he's institutionalized and... There's this guy that's describing what his particular neurosis is. And he's like, you know, they say that I'm, I'm reality divergent. And then he says, are you divergent too, friend? And all through 2014 with that stupid divergent <laughs> movie, I kept thinking, are you divergent too, friend? Like that's going to be the, the tagline. Tag you know, like, you know, at the end of the trailer, it says www.areyoudivergenttofriend.com. Boy, well, let's just stop recording and watch 12 Monkeys. <laughs> All right. Um, and now it's time to talk about something completely different. Hey, uh, let me interrupt for a minute. Uh, I mentioned uh, The Raven, and it reminded me of how Marshall Latham does a an Edgar Allan Poe month every, I guess it's every January, or he does it every year. Anyway, he'll have people write stories that borrow the title of a uh, Poe poem or a uh, story. Right. And they can be about anything, but they have to share that, that title. Okay. And uh, he's gotten one of his favorite writers, Ken Scholes, to commit to doing this, to writing a story for Marshall, for Marshall's show, and to get the money to pay Ken He's doing a Kickstarter campaign. And now you and I had uh, considered doing a Kickstarter campaign a couple of years ago. And, and because of various reasons we won't go into, we didn't do it. Yeah. But I think it's really neat that Marshall has done it. And uh, he, he just needs to raise $560. And uh, he's got... It, yeah, the, the, the fun thing about these uh, Kickstarter campaigns is like the little rewards or incentives or whatever that the people will come up with if if you back them right and i thought it was neat that if you pledge a hundred dollars or more marshall will write a three thousand word or less story based upon your wettest dream uh. no no let me make sure it based upon uh, any premise you choose and i just thought that would be so much fun if if you and i ever did a kickstarter thing that the funnest thing Besides spending the money on drugs. They forced me to take drugs. Forced you? Why did someone force you to take drugs? Would be uh, coming up with these uh, rewards. And yeah, to, be, to, to write a story for somebody would be really neat. Which I, I guess Marshall and Ken Scholes uh, are soon to find out. But anyway, if you would like to back Marshall's Kickstarter, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's listed among the Kickstarter projects. But it's easier just to go to uh, journeyintopodcast.blogspot.com and just listen to Marshall's description and, uh, and, and click on there. I, I, I think he'll make it. Hopefully this episode will come out in time for him to make it. But uh, on with the show. Okay. So we do need to chastise Brian Lincoln. I think we, we haven't chastised him enough for making us run a poem uh, on our show. I think we did an episode way back near the beginning. Well, Kevin when David we, Anderson did one for us, didn't what, Yeah, well, did Kevin do the poem before we complained I think it about poetry, or was it in response to his poem? I remember that being really, really cool. And that was back when, in the days when we could afford to do two <laughs> stories in one episode. Yeah, with that, that was the, uh, the first Broken Mirror story yeah, episode. Kevin David Anderson threw together a really short poem. It was 
you know, this one is like War and Peace compared to his poem. It was like three or four lines. I don't remember how long it was, but basically we read it in the space of 40 seconds or something like that. And we had this awesome Roger Subarana song playing <laughs> yes, underneath it, which it was it, it was kind of sad because, you know, once we used that song, we'd used it and it was kind of like, oh, crap, we can't use that again. The song is so rad. We need to use it for every episode. Yeah, I wanted it to be our theme song. Yeah, one time I think I did use the same music a second time and somebody complained immediately. They're That's like, what the heck is with this song? You guys used this last time. <laughs> you used this like a month and a half ago or I don't remember. <laughs> so I learned my lesson and not use the songs again. I was kind of sad that we never got to use that Roger Subarana song again. But yeah, it was from all the way back from the first Broken Mirror contest. We ran two episodes and each episode contained three stories. Holy cow, really? Yeah. One was the ultra short one at the very start. Each one of those were like super shorties that were like a minute long. Then there was a medium length one and then a long one at the end. And yeah, that first one had Kevin David Anderson's poem. And I made, so we complained about it right then and there, huh? Warning. Today's episode contained comments from Rish Outfield. Listener discretion is advised. Well, at some point, I think it was before we ever did a Broken Mirror story, we reached out to Tim Pratt hoping he would send us a story. And he said, no, I won't give you a story. I'll give you a poem, though. And I'll speak for myself instead of you. I was so insulted <laughs> by that that I was just like, F you, Tim Pratt. You may have written the best story that ever was on Escape Pod, but a poem? And so I think we did a little <laughs> rant, rant about that. And then, yeah, the Kevin David Anderson Jr. Ben Cluth poem we ran. And I'm sure we complained about poems then. Yeah, we've we've complained at least uh, our fair amount about poems in the past. And so that led Brian Lincoln to ask us the musical question. He, he said, which is more likely for you to do on the Dune, Steve? One, be a weekly show again. Two, run a story in the second person. Or three, <laughs> run a poem. And I just, I was so amused by this. this yeah, it was a very it was like, funny. None of these things ever. Yeah, it was a funny question because, yeah, it, it basically got to the heart of everything that doesn't work on the Dune Steve. <laughs> Being weekly just doesn't work. Running poems doesn't work. And running second person stories doesn't work. Although the funny thing is, there has been times in the past where each one of those things actually happened. We yeah. were weekly for at least a month. We did run a story in the second person. If you want to listen to it. Why would they? It was called a Silver by Tad Callen, and it ran on August 15th, 2008. Whoa, it we... was episode number six of our show. We've never run another second person story ever. We have complained and done entire episodes of That Gets My Goat complaining about second person stories. But we did actually run one within the first six episodes of the show. And of course, we also have run a poem before. And now Brian Lincoln, who asked this question before when we did a question and answer show on the Dune Steve has forced our hand <laughs> and here we are with another poem although at least it was good i don't know how he could have forced our hand if he hadn't made it good <laughs> that wouldn't have really done a whole lot but it was really good i actually as far as it goes i liked it a lot yeah he can he can smugly sit there and, and know that he he beat us <laughs> because you know he wrote something good enough that we had to play it despite our dislike for poetry, and uh, he can also smugly sit there uh, knowing that he's handsome. And a doctor. He's his favorite doctor. Yes, he is. <laughs> and he's your favorite doctor, too, when it comes down to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now it's time for Shill, my shite. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're, we're not really calling it that, are we? Um, I guess announcer man didn't like Go plug yourself so we came up with something new. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Uh, hey, <laughs> announcer man, thank you for sh uh, showing up today. I know it's been a long, long time. I meant to address this, 
that this is the first episode in a good long time. First time I've been in your house in months. Yeah, we we have still gotten together and done stuff. We've recorded a few That Gets My Goats. We've watched some movies and stuff like that. We did that one episode for... Uh... Yeah, we even did last the last episode, The Empire State Building Strikes Back. We just recorded that in the car with the Zoom instead of actually coming back and setting up the nice mics and getting the good sound. It's been a while. We basically skipped the whole summer. We're going to probably go out and walk around the neighborhood for a little while to stretch our legs and rest our voices right after this. And usually we like when summer arrives because we can do lots of walking around outside and we hate when winter arrives because we cannot. Unfortunately, this year we skipped all the being able to walk around months. And this may well be our last walk around of the year already. It's also the first. I hope not. <laughs> we we walked around in town, I think, didn't That's we? That's true. That, remember there was an episode last year or the year before where we actually carried the mic with us. On yeah, the I think that was the Lone Ranger episode. We walked around and oh, talked no, no, while no, we no, walked. I meant one where we wound up in the... the Lone Ranger was in the park. Oh, we you're around. right. We did do that one where we walked up the hill and everything. Huh, I well, don't we remember didn't have what the that one was. the prophylactic on the uh, recorder and the, the oh, yeah. wind was really loud. Lots of wind, wind noise going. Well, anyways, we're we're not going to that. We're shilling our shite here. Ugh. And since we're talking about shite, I guess that means it's my turn. Okay, only fair. <laughs> what I'm going to go ahead and shill today, it's not really a shill because I think shill involves selling or trying to get someone to buy it. In this case, it's just letting people know that something exists and is available, and it's free. Mm. Um, next time I'll shill some shite. That's hard to Sh- say. Sean, what? That's hard to say, Sean. I wrote a story. I did a, We did a whole event, really, me and you together, where we wrote a story and blogged it. It was basically, we called it a live blogging of our story. I don't know if that's a thing. It's or... not. We, we could have come up with a better name for it. <laughs> But we did not. Yeah. So anyways, uh, I wrote a story on my blog called Fireflies. And I liked it so much that the couple weeks later, I wrote a second story on my blog, live blogging, called Dr. Claw. And these stories are still there on my blog, available for anybody to read if they would like. The blog is at Big Anklevich dot blogspot.com there is only one g in big anklevich in case you were wondering big anklevich dot blogspot.com you go there so there's a link to it in the show notes the link will lead you to the first day of the story which was june 9th 2014 that's the first day of fireflies and all of them have a label of fireflies that kind of connects them together if you click on that label i'm not sure exactly i was looking at the blog and it doesn't have the labels on the side maybe i can figure out how to get that set up before this episode airs so that people can just click on the labels on the side and get them to just that particular story that would be useful too yeah but you're going to leave fireflies up forever yeah i think so maybe someday when i actually get it published i will remove it Okay. But for now, yeah, it's staying. And uh, anybody can go and read it and enjoy it. And also, there is Dr. Claw there as well. And I'll put a link to the first post of that story. And you can just follow that one down the line, too. And read it and enjoy it. It's it's uh, something you can check out, something that I wrote. I really think Fireflies is one of my better stories. I really enjoyed it, and I thought it turned out well. Yeah, if only you had... Good episode art that somebody worked really, really hard on that you never used. But that's cool. You also said that you might continue to do this live blogging thing into well into the future. It's possible. I may still do it. I've written another story since the live blog, and I didn't live blog that one. I'm not sure why, to tell you the truth. Just I didn't. Maybe I'll post that story still. I am also one other thing that I've been doing on here is I've been posting chapters of the novel that I'm trying to write as I go. So far, only chapters one and two are up because that's all I've written. But I mean to post every chapter as I go 
on there as well. So you can check those out too. They're all available and they are free. So, you know, check them out and enjoy them. Yeah, it's good to know that people uh, are paying attention to the stuff that we do or that we write and uh, that they want to hear more. That Sometimes that's all you need to hear to get you off your gigantic gluteus maximus and uh, do a little bit more. You should have gone Brian Lincoln poem style on us and say that's all you need to hear to get you off your rear. Ooh, that would have been good. But, uh, <laughs> I was sure you were going to go there, but no. That could have been good, but it sure wasn't. <laughs> all right. Well, that uh, brings us to the end of the show then, I think. We'd like to thank everybody for listening. We'd like to chastise Brian Lincoln for sending us this story today. And thank Sunny C for uh, producing, doing the episode art, the manning the craft service table, and uh, narrating and running the lighting rigs. Fluffer, and... yes, these many things that he's done. <laughs> Fluffer, yikes! And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. I'm Big Anklevich, and I'm Rich Outfield, and. Follow that compass to the well of your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> That's inspiring. You've really done it. You know what my new inspiring phrase that I'm going to use is? Is it a, uh, a, a goal is a dream with a deadline? No. It's, it's from an insurance commercial that I've watched recently where they say, dreams don't come true. Dreams are made true. Oh, I like that. I'm Big Anklevich. Thanks for listening. Bye. Goodbye, boys. Have fun storming the castle. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Justin Charles is my master now. Take two. Answer me these questions three. One, was this a fun contest for you? Hey, I'm now being angry. Is writing generally fun to do anyway? How did the rules of this contest make it more or less enjoyable to you? Oh, uh, you know, that was three questions right there. <laughs> this weird expression you had on your face. Yeah. <laughs> He's a doctor? Look at that first sentence. I had a lot of fun to write. <laughs> He's not really a doctor. I think he's been fooling us all along. Okay. How did you decide? In what way to use the words? My words were c*** beast. <laughs> um, sorry. Sorry, your, your, your dyslexia is coming out. Your uh, socially inept dyslexia is coming out. It's a Freudian thing, I think, there. I, I read what I wanted to see. <laughs> when I was a kid, I once got a knife as a kid. I was like, when I was a kid, I pushed a guy into a well. <laughs> when I was a kid, I once knifed someone as a gift. I mean, sorry, got a knife as a gift. Oh, it's Freudian slip again. That's right. He once shot a man in Reno. Just, Just watch him die. die. Uh, is all of this stuff getting cut out? Or <laughs> Yes, I okay. think most of it needs to. Let me tell you of the days of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now behold your hosts. The Dread Big Anglovich and the infamous Rish Outfield.